We start with that celery brimbo fella battling some form of early onset dementia. Given he can't remember where he's put his hammer or the name of that basic bitch who's been his primary assistant for weeks. And after being told the dwarves are late with their mithril deliveries and also being called out for being a right grumpy Gregory lately, old Celis is primed to smack a bitch up. Until Anatard bursts in to calm things down and tells him to stop bollocking nondescript female blacksmiths and take a chill pill, bro. And I'll head over to Kazakh Doom to tell them midget fellas to pull their fingers out. And to stop being bloody cheap and upgrade to Amazon Prime's next day delivery already. Meanwhile, over in Mordor, the winner of the resting bitch face competition, aka Gladys, physically cringes when Adar reveals that Sauron promised him children. And before she can say, I know schools these days teach some truly weird shit, but I don't think you'll have much luck getting two sausages to make a sprog IRL. He brags about kind of sort of killing Sauron the first time with his own crown and an army of mercs. But if they can get hold of her rings, they can then take the spiky helmet to a Regian and finally end him once and for all. <sighs> or some shit. Elsewhere in Numenor, poor Elendil gets a Trump treatment by being indicted on false charges in a farcical kangaroo court run by his own enemies who hates his guts. But are mercifully willing to quash his convictions if he totally bends the knee and pledges fealty to that usurper Farazon fella as a true king and thereby chuck that disabled ethnic minority queen under the bus and stuff. But naturally, he don't really want to cuck out and humiliate himself worse than Prince Harry in front of all his people. So just tells him, you can stick your offer up your gonga pal. Because that chocolate bird is my boss. So stop trying to manipulate me into doing actual treason and also making me look a right tit in front of all my mates. And shut up about it already. Also elsewhere, Thomas Bombadil gives phony fakey Gandalf a sudden ultimatum and tells him he has to make a choice. Between saving his new mate Nori from that dark wizard fella and his team of naughty bounty hunters, or staying with old Tom Bomb here and learning how to master his magics and stuff. Because the latter will ensure that the entire realm is saved over the lives of a few hairy halfwits. Though if he chooses the former, he can't ever come back here to resume his training because reasons. Speaking of hairy halfwits, Nori wonders whether she should actually turn herself in to maybe have a chance at saving her BFF Pop Pops. While said poppy bird is out here lips in that Asian vagrant who clearly can't believe his fucking luck getting a snog off the first fat bird he's run into in the desert. Nice. Meanwhile, over in the land of vertically challenged individuals of limited stature, Durin Jr. passively aggressively bollocks that Anatard fella when the Lord of the Gifts asks for more mithril to build extra rings, which are clearly corrupting his dad and making him more paranoid than the Jeremy Kyle guest back in the day. But the king totally refuses Tardface's initial proposal of a truckload of pussy old timber. Mainly because he knows war is coming to Middle Earth and the elves are totally fucked without their special mineral and will thus come groveling back with a better offer. And Anal Tard promptly leads with a smirk after seeing a vision of the future hinting they're all about to be wiped out by a giant hell beastie bullrog thing any day now anyway. And after worrying that his dad is now a total slave to the will of the ring he challenges the king to take it off and totally prove he ain't been cucked by a simple piece of jewellery. But he totally refuses after the ring whispers to him and tells him not to listen to hairy midgets with dodgy accents no more. So as a last result, Durin tackles his own father and totally tries to force himself on his ring. It is steady. And just ends up getting smacked across the fucking room for his troubles which just makes him burst into tears when his diverse wifey bird Deezer tells him how they now have no choice but to act to save the kingdom, because his dad opening up another shaft and totally doubling the mining efforts will only lead to their entire ruin and stuff. Speaking of blubbering melts, an equally teary Arian begs her dad to stop being a stubborn git and totally sell out his integrity already, given he's now facing capital punishment and death by sea worm. And she's already lost to her Aladdin looky like he brother bro, and can't face now losing her papa and all. But he just says no way fam. Until Muriel bursts in. And also tells him to stop trying to be a martyr. Because Numenor is going to need blokes like him. Who lead nautical cults and worship the sea and she. The sea is always right. The sea is always right. Later back in Khazad Doom. Deezer has channeled the energy of Extinction Rebellion. And plumped herself in front of the miners whilst refusing to move. So head honcho Navi sets his men to haul her away already. Until she suddenly starts having an adult tantrum and cringily screeches in their faces. Which eventually summons a swarm of bats. And before you can say, oh god cool, don't tell me it's fucking morbid time again. They run off like a riot bunch of scaredy cats. 
whilst Farazon and his royal goons promptly sent Elendil to the execution pond. Bart is luckily saved in the nick of time by the stunning and ringing blind black queen, who completely emasculates him by volunteering herself to go in his place. Naturally, this is music to Farazon's ears, given he can now get rid of the actual heir to the throne totally legitimately and in front of the people. And although Elendil protests at the undermining of his own heroics, she soon enters the pool and is totally dragged down by a giant fuck-off sea worm. But also luckily, turns out said giant fuck-off sea worm is a giant racialist and don't really want to gobble down an individual with such high melanin content, because I guess they play havoc with the old cholesterol and shit. So probably spits her back up to the surface. And poor Farris just can't believe his cunning plan to be rid of his most troublesome ops has backfired in his face somehow. And has hilariously only ended up undermining his own authority. Now that people believe she was spared by the gods and likely is the true ruler and stuff. No! Elsewhere, Galadriel was busy spilling her guts to Adar, given she accepted his offer to do a trucy team up to stop the common enemy and probably tells him all about how Halbrand is actually Sauron, and that Elrond is heading back to Eregion with a ring of power and shit. But after realising he plans to destroy Eregion in the process, Gladys warns the crusty fella that taking his army of orcs over there must be exactly what Sauron wants, given he's a super secret cunning genius what once got killed by his own hat, because that'll just result in giving him an army of his own. But he just says, I don't give a shit girl, and I'm totally going to do that mental siege thing. Now go back to acting school, and shut up about it already. And we end with the orcs beginning their attack on Eregion, as total carnage promptly breaks loose, and the sound of sirens and screams totally makes Celery Brimbor slightly concerned. But Halbrand, aka Sauron, aka Anatard, aka the Lord of the fucking Gifts and Silly Weeks, totally gaslights him again by saying everything's totally fine, bro. And then proves it by manipulating his mind and creating visions of a multiracial utopia before handing him some more mithril muck what he got from fuck knows where, and sends him inside to get back to work on the rings already, before we transition back to the real world, where everyone's running around like headless chickens and getting bombed by feral savages, and I don't mean by hordes of current day Antifa goons. And that's it, that's episode 5, though my favourite part was the Game of Thrones style Ned Stark show trial, mixed with the budget House of the Dragon Civil War shit going on. And look, we even have an extra Targaryen sibling hiding out in this show. But anyway, on to the penultimate Eddie. We start with Celery Brimbor finally completing the Nine Rings of Power. And before you can say, great, now can we finally end this garbage show and pretend it never freaking existed? He totally thanks Anatard for giving him such clarity in recent weeks to complete his work. Despite having put him under reality warping spell like that fucking WandaVision bird and turning him into a typical liberal leftist by making him live in an ignorant bubble of false reality. As outside IRL, the naughty orcs are laying waste to the city, and after spending the past few weeks gaslighting senior citizens, Anity turns up the gaslighting again by telling everyone how that old fella's lost his mind and don't really want to get involved in all the warring. So now the Lord of the Gifts has totally taken command, given the orcs are now smashing up the local landscape to pave over the river and shit. Elsewhere, King Durin tells Na'vi to take his men and go deal with them just stop mining nutters who are camped out in front of the new dig site, because the greedy twat wants even more gold for fuck's sake. But once down there, said Na'vi fella immediately gives in and does a trucy team up with Prince Durin and his chocolatey floozy, because that bleeding ring is totally cucked the king, and then tells the prince that there's some flat faced fella waiting to see him upstairs. And he's over the moon to finally see his gormless mate after his dad kicked him out of Khazad Doom last season. But says he can't really help in his elfy war against literal Satan given he's about to do a sneaky coo thing and overthrow his own papa and she. Meanwhile, back at Regin, old Sellers has suddenly noticed he's in the fucking Truman Show where the candle wicks ain't burned all day and the same mouse keeps running to the same spot every 10 minutes like that cat in the first Matrix film. So naturally... He totally calls Anatard out on putting him in some sort of endless time warp and making him work his fingers to the bone for hours on end without a break. Because that's against union regulations and stuff. Especially whilst his palace was burning down all around him, which was like super dangerous, bro. And after finding out that that supposed miracle mithril stash from last epi was actually just a pot of tarred faces evil black blood, he realises he's been played like a total chump for weeks by that Sauron fella. I just can't believe a magical angel who randomly appeared in his fireplace to help make his dreams come true for no reason would now turn out to be too good to be true. So naturally, he runs off to his sweet blonde assistant, whose name he can never remember, 
to totally snitch on his business partner being Beazelbub himself and she. But also, naturally, no fucker quite believes him. Especially when Anatar tells them all this fella's gone full Biden and they shouldn't listen to anything this demented donut says. So he tries to prove it by telling them all to look at his hand injury was full of unnatural black slime. And before you can say, okay, but you know this fella can walk reality and shape perceptions given he's just spent the past few weeks doing that to you and everyone here, so it's probably pretty pointless trying to show that as proof. He goes on to indeed warp reality and shape perceptions by raising up a normal bloody hand full of the red stuff. And poor Sellers is so startled, he has a little shout in a small lady's face. And with a little force nudge in from El Tardo, she's thrown off the ledge and probably finished off by orcs. And the baddie just says, See? That's what happens when you finally touch a girl. Now stop playing silly buggers and knocking small fannies off bridges and get me my rings already. A little later, Elrond returns and has a little sit down chat with Ada, given his captured and unusually quiet Galadriel. And before you can say, oh, where's the Tempest in you now, girl? Ada demands a ring what Gladys gave to Elrond for safekeeping a few eppies back, so he can finally defeat the Lord of the Pricks once and for all. But Elrond refuses to trade it for a small elf with perpetual PMT, and instead just gives her a pity snog and leaves her to get totally deaded. But turns out he's got a secret plan, which is to piss about chatting shit and wait for a small army of midgets to come save their asses. This isn't going to end well. Speaking of, said small army of midgets first listen to Prince Durin give a stirring speech, encouraging them all to join him in going off to save the elves, because they're getting their asses totally handed to them to be fair. And after Elrond's horsey gets deaded right in front of him, he finally stops waiting around for the midget cavalry to stop singing hi ho all day and actually turn up on time, and goes fucking beast mode. Whilst that good guy orc who just wanted to take his goblin wife and keep cottaging back in episode 3, starts to worry that his boss don't really care about their lives or his future vacation goals, as he tells them to shut up whining about everyone dying and bring down the fucking wall already. Because Adar's got bigger things to worry about, now Gladys has used a brooch what Elrond secretly slipped her earlier when he was slipping his tongue down her gob to totally escape her cuffs. And before she's caught and exposed worse than a UK Labour MP accepting secret bags of cash and clothes, she's saved in the nick of time by the first black elf with zero personality. Huzzah! Whilst back at Khazad Doom, a blood-soaked Na'vi turns up and says they can't go save the elves from crusty goblin monsters and the literal devil himself, because the midget king's gone proper mental and started carving up his own men like common hogs. So they need the army to do that coup thing after all, before all of midget land falls, given the king is trying to unleash the hell beast what sleeps under their gaff and stuff. And after Atard tortures Seabrim with another sob story about his tragic history of Morgoth not treating him very nicely or some shit, Sellers breaks out of his cuffs by chopping off his own thumb and bringing a whole new meaning to committing to digital freedoms. But once outside, he hilariously gets blown up, not two bloody feet from his own doorstep, and is instantly recaptured. But luckily, Gladys soon appears via the magic of lazy editing and tells the guards to stop manhandling a now disabled pensioner and start bloody fighting the real baddies already. And for some reason, they totally comply, despite her not being around here for weeks to see Sellers slowly losing his mind to dementia and what's now so bad he's even self-harming to the point of amputation. And after he says sorry for being an arrogant prick for the past few weeks and constantly forgetting the names of his own staff, he gives Gladys the rings to smuggle out of the city before they fall into the grubby mitts of the Lord of the Gits. Meanwhile, the elves are still trying to hold off the orcs from bringing down their wall defences, as the expert Asian archer elf gets herself penetrated by multiple shafts, but not in a Brazzers way. But luckily, she summons her last bit of energy to blow a load of fuckers to Kingdom Come, before getting shafted again and totally face in the mud. Also meanwhile, Adar tells the pussy old family man orc, who keeps waffling on about the Middle Earthian dream, to stop whining on about how their super secret super weapon will just end up getting loads of their own kind killed in the process, and sends in Piers Morgan regardless. It's it, I mean, sends in Damrod the Gormless Troll. Anyway, the abused trauma victim then confronts his abuser with a bunch of guards, who all then get mind controlled into turning on each other worse than Democrat Party leaders cooing each other out of office and shit. Bruh. Whilst outside, the first black charisma vacuum turns up and helps Elrond and co take down the ugly troll after it kills some more horses for no reason before the bloody elf king finally turns up 
once most of the fight is finished and the danger is mostly over. And before they can say, oh, where were you five minutes ago when Tim Walks was lobbing innocent elves at walls and chewing the heads off poor sods? The ginger elf arrives, seemingly fatally wounded from his trip to Kazakh Doom to save the dwarves then coming to save their asses in the nick of time no more. So they're all totally screwed, son. And instead of seeking medical treatment for his red-headed chum, Elrond just stares into space, repeating the phrase during will come over and over and trying to convince himself that his best mate what he ain't seen for months hasn't totally turned his back on people he actually owes nothing to. Whilst Adar himself soon enters the battle and immediately does a hate crime by shanking up poor Arondir. And it looks like it's curtains for the number one ex-CNN news anchor. When suddenly, a despondent Elrond is totally bested and all and has his ring violently violated and ripped out from under him. It's it steady. And that's it. That's the penultimate Ebby. Now, my favourite part, well, apart from the random death metal tune playing out over the end credits for some reason. Okay. Was just how emotionally engaging and competent the writing was. Because although the Asian elf dies, the soulless ginger elf dies, and the dopey blonde assistant elf dies, the saddest death is somehow Elrond's horse, who we've barely even seen in this show. But anyway, that's the plot and that has a lot. Considering that bell thing, so you don't miss the roast of the final epi when it drops. Tell me if you like this show in the comments, if you have time. And I'll take down Piers Morgan with you in the next one.